I can't help but think about Philippians chapter 2 when she was singing that, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. People shy away from that, from His name, but a lot of people like to use generalities and say, well, you know, God... Yeah, you can talk about God, but people have all kind of conceptions of God. But Jesus Christ, that's the name. Amen. All right. Let's take our Bibles and open up to 2 Kings chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6. If you'd like to stand with us as we read. 2 Kings chapter number 6. We'll begin in verse number 8. 2 Kings chapter 6 in verse number 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such a such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place where the man of God told him, and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw... And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will, show, I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they were coming to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink, and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Now, this is a very interesting passage. Obviously, Elisha has been performing several miracles. Now, if you know your Bible, you know Elisha performed double the miracles that Elijah did. And we're kind of right in the middle of Elisha's performance. I mean, he lives... Well, I say lives in, in Bible times, you know, as far as chapters, all the way to like chapter 14, um, uh, chapter 13. So we're kind of halfway in the middle of Elisha's story, and he's doing all these things in the northern area, which is Israel, not the southern tribes of Judah there. And he's telling on the king of Syria about his encampments, and he's giving that intel, that inside information to the king of Israel that has their headquarters there in Samaria. 
And so when this Syrian king finds out that Elisha is the one getting all this intel, he sends somebody to go after Elijah. And we keep seeing this phrase in this story, and we see these things happen where this guy, the servant can't see, and he says, all right, open his eyes. And then he takes these Syrians, and he says, Lord, blind their eyes that they can't see. Then he gets them back into the camp of Israel, into their enemies, and he says, open their eyes. So we have this thing back and forth, and it's interesting to me that the servant of the man of God could not see what the man of God could see until he opened his eyes and he could see that there was this, these chariots of fire, protection all around these mountains, showing that even though it seemed like they were outnumbered and overwhelmed and there was no way just those two guys, the prophet and the servant, could stand against this great army, Elisha asked God to show him that they were really on the winning side. So that's what I want to preach on a little bit this morning. The fact that we are on the winning side, even though it seems like we're outnumbered. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Steve, good to see you. Can you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message for us? Dear Heavenly Father, it's so good to be back in church this morning. Lord, we're just thankful for everything you've done for us, Lord. Allow us to be here, Lord, to hear your word. Lord, we just ask you to open our hearts and clear our minds that may, may get a message from you. Bless the pastor that he may move, that Lord may move him aside and give us something from you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. When we look at this passage, like I said, it's interesting as you see eyes opened, eyes closed. And we get this whole concept and idea. But we also see the fact that you got Elisha and his servant and they are in the middle and they're surrounded, it seems like, by the enemy and there's no way they can win. And they seem to be completely outnumbered. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes in my life, I get to that place to where I'm just a little bit overwhelmed. I'm just a little bit, it seems like, outnumbered. I seem that, it seems to me that things aren't going along too great. It seems to me when we look at our current situation in the world, it seems like the world's got more on their side than we have on our side. It seems like we're outnumbered. It seems like, and I will say this, there are more people that don't believe than do believe. There are more God-haters than God-lovers. There are more people that don't believe the Bible than do believe the Bible. There are more preachers that aren't preaching than are preaching. There are more Christians that aren't living the Christian life than are living the Christian life. And so that sometimes has a bad effect on me. It sometimes pulls me down. Until I remember, until I'm reminded, until I revisit the fact that we're on the winning team. I've read the end of the book. I want to encourage you, those of you who haven't read the book of Revelation, you need to read it. It's, people say, well, I'm scared of the book of Revelation. You read the end of the story, especially the last few chapters. God wipes away all tears. He wipes away all sorrow, all suffering, all pain. All those that are saved are safe. We're with God. There's a reunion. We're all there. We see how the end of the story comes up. I like Revelation 20, verse number 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. When the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Amen? That's where he's going. And we know what's going to happen to him. I don't know about you, but he's given me some trouble. And so I don't like him or appreciate him. And I see what he does. The Bible says the devil walketh the bottom of the line seeking whom he may devour. Then I think about this world. I know a lot of people are hugging trees because they can't touch nobody. I get that. <laughs> I haven't done that, but uh, they say go out and hug a tree. You know, I don't know. But, and I know people are worried about the environment and they don't want to throw it on a piece of trash. And I'm not telling you to go throw donuts on the ground. Of course, you throw a donut on the ground, somebody might eat it after you. But uh, don't go out and litter and try to ruin this world. But this world, this idea that we are entrusted with saving the environment, where did that come from? God is going to take this world and use it as kindling wood, and He's going to burn it up one day. Yeah. The day of the Lord, the Bible says, cometh as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Peter goes on to say, See, and then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be burned up? So we should be looking for that new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, he goes on to say. 
And so we're on the winning side. I want to encourage you as we think about this passage here about some things because just living from day to day, going through struggles, not just with the world and not just with the devil, but going through your own personal struggles, sometimes it's easy to get defeated. It's easy to have that defeatist attitude. And so I want to encourage you a little bit, hopefully, from the text. You'll notice, first of all, we see rattled peace. In other words, this guy, this servant here, some things are going on that uh, it's pretty, pretty rough. I mean, if you go back and you read about Elisha, I wish we had time because really all of Elisha's miracles, they kind of build and it's a crescendo. But he's done all these things and this servant is, is kind of getting to see all this stuff. I mean, uh, you talk about feeding the multitudes. They had a little bit of food and they were able to multitude, multiply it to feed a hundred men. Uh, he was able to uh, uh, put some, uh, some salt into the, the, the bitter water and it was cured. Um, he was able to, uh, the guy lost the axe head and he said, where did it go? He went down in the water and he threw a stick into the water and the, and the Bible says the iron did swim. I mean, there's all kind of things. Naaman the Syrian, I mean, you would think they would be appreciative, but they'd come after him. But Naaman was the captain of Syria. He had leprosy. He sends somebody, he goes to see Elisha. Elijah don't even come out, Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him. He just says, you go tell Naaman, go down in the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times, you'll come up and be cleansed of the leprosy. What does he do? At first he's like, I ain't doing that, man. I could go some of these nicer rivers. You want me to get in that muddy Jordan River? I mean, good night. I don't want to, I'm a, I'm a cap. Does he know who I am? He goes through this whole spiel and finally Naaman's servants say, look, you need to do this. This guy's doing all these miracles and God's with this man. If he tells you to do it, do it. So he goes, he goes, okay, I'll try it. One time, don't do anything. Second time, doesn't happen. Third, he does it. The seventh time he comes up, the Bible says his flesh is like the flesh of a little child. He's cleansed and healed of his leprosy. All these miracles have been taking place. And in this servant, this man is with this man of God, with Elisha. And I guarantee you, he's excited. I mean, each, can you imagine being with Elisha? You never know what the day's going to bring. I mean, all kind of things are happening. He's doing double the miracles that, Elisha, that Elijah did. And so, all of a sudden, things change rapidly. Here in 2 Kings chapter number 6, when the king of Syria sends these troops, the next morning... The servant of the man of God gets up and looks around there and he sees all these people, all these warriors, all these chariots, a great host. Everything changes the next day. You know, sometimes uh, one day can bring about a lot of change. Sometimes you can all of a sudden, you can see the meanness and the malice that's in the hearts of people. And it just seems like sometimes it rears its ugly head different times than other times and you just really see wow everything has changed here uh, these guys are coming after us and there's no way in the world we can defeat that uh, several years back our great supreme court in the land made a decision against the bible concerning sodomy you know the story several years back we're not going to that's not going to change this is a wicked godless country that's not going to change. So are you glad you're here? Yeah, I'm glad I'm here. But I'm just telling you, morally, this country is shot. Liquor stores all over the place. People smoking dope, smoking pot, getting drunk, fornicating, sleeping around, doing all this stuff. It's godless. And you're not going back. They're not going to revoke this stuff. 70 million, whatever it is, abortions. You're not going to, that's larger than the state of Florida, larger than, Al larger than California. However, maybe I'm wrong on my numbers. I think it's somewhere up in there. You go look it up. Godless, it's not going back. And you look around and you think, man, look how far we've come. Some of you older folks in here, you're just shaking your head thinking, this is not the America I grew up in as a child. Here we are. And sometimes it creeps up on you like a dark cloud and you're just looking around and you're encamped. Notice the secrecy and the surprise. The king of Syria, he spied out to find out where Elisha was. Even though Elisha had helped the captain of Syria, Naaman, he, there's, there's always conspiracies going on. Amen. 
(laughs) There's always somebody that wants to attack you. And the devil definitely wants to do that. And so who's he going to use? Principalities and powers in high places. Who's he going to use? He's going to use authorities. He's going to use those that have the ability. He's going to use those in the religious world to take scriptures, to take ideas, to take things and twist and come in and try to attack. And here there's a secrecy that comes. There's a surprise that comes. Notice he cries out in verse number 15, Alas! That word alas is a term that is an exclamation expressive of sorrow, grief, concern, or apprehension of evil. It's not at last, it's alas. We sing it in one of the songs, alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die. Alas, it's a cry out. Alas, Master, how shall we do? Not just what shall we do, but how shall we do? The confusion here is evident. He doesn't know and understand what they're going to do, why this happened to them. He thought this was a man of God. I mean, he's, he's all of a sudden, his world's turned upside down. He, he, he's just in a state of confusion. And then the consternation here, the fear, verse number 16. He's afraid. You know, fear, you focus on the negative, you focus on the evil, you focus on the circumstances. There's the point of it, there's the poverty of it. It produces nothing good, and it leaves nothing good in its wake. And when you think about this man, he's just one step after another. First, there's the surprise, there's the shock, there's the taking it all in. Sometimes you have to, pro- you ever have to process? You, you do through something, you get the shock, you get the news, you get the stuff, and then you're, it's just, it has to soak in, it takes time. Then as that stuff begins to soak in, if you're not careful in balancing what you're taking in the ear gate and the eye gate with the infallible Word of God, you're going to have the wrong feelings. Here's two men. Here's Elisha and here's this servant. Elisha's sitting there. I kind of picture him like he was when Naaman called. You remember when Naaman came, you know, about getting baptized or getting the leprosy? I picture Elisha just sitting in the house Got his feet propped up. He's eating some popcorn. <laughs> I don't know. I just, he's just taking it easy, man. And Naaman comes knocking at the door. I mean, this is the captain of the host of Syria. And Elisha doesn't even get up. He just tells his servant, you go tell him to dip seven times a door. He's just calm, cool, and collected. It's the same thing here. The servant, all of a sudden, he's like, uh, Master, I've been up since you could start seeing things, and I thought I was, was indeed seeing things, but I'm seeing that there are people and chariots and soldiers alert all around us. Elisha's like, yeah, what of it? Did you pray this morning? <laughs> he's like, yeah, what of it? Uh, we got the joy, 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 joy down in our heart. Are you ready to have church? Two men in the same circumstances, in the same location, seeing the same thing with complete, totally different attitudes. Now, what's the difference? Well, one is filled with fear and one's filled with faith. Psalm 3, verse 6, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. You ever been in crowds? Don't you love big crowds? Especially now. I guess probably the biggest crowd I was in outside of being in big airports and stuff like that uh, when you consider the whole location. But I was in a uh, baseball playoff game up in Atlanta, Atlanta Braves game. There was a record. uh, The attendance was almost 57,000 people in that stadium. That's probably the largest crowd I've been. Maybe some of you have been in larger crowds. That's a pretty big crowd. And you think about the uh, apprehension of that. The psalmist says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me. And I couldn't imagine being in that crowd in the center of the arena with 56,000 people and then all of a sudden they all turn their attention on me and want to kill me. It would be a little different than just being there, you know, doing a tomahawk chop with them. Psalm 27, 3, Though an host should camp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. Psalm 34, 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. Big difference between Elisha and the servant. But you know, we get afraid. We get afraid when we think about being outnumbered. We get afraid when we get overwhelmed. When we think about what is there. And that fear often sets in. 
And what offsets that? The only thing that can offset that is your faith. I was reading about a uh, back in the day when they had limited schooling. Back in the day before you had automobiles and transportation and, and all these kind of things, there was a rural area where there was a young man that wanted to continue his school, but he was obviously at a place to where they only went to like the sixth grade, and he was a teenager, young teenager now. And if he was going to continue school, he was going to have to go to a community, you know, the closest community that had that school. And in order to do so, he would be able to stay with some relatives over there, but he couldn't come home until Fridays, and he'd have to walk home. And that all sounded good, except he knew that road home was known for being a rough road home. Not just a rough road as far as walking on it, but people have been robbed on that road. There had been some murders committed on that road. And it was going to take him a while to walk it. And so he was real scared about this thing. He went to school the whole week. He'd stay with his relatives. Here comes Friday. School gets out. He takes off walking fast. And sure enough, the sun's starting to go down and gets dark. Right around that spot where he knew it was kind of, you know, he had a lot of the trees, the canopy trees, and, you know, anybody could be hiding out. And, he, and then he thought, you know how you do this? I remember being a kid riding my bicycle at evening time, and you think the big monster's behind you. The clouds turn into these monsters, and you're pedaling, and you're like, oh, i got to get home, i got to get home. And you think you hear something in the woods. You ever walk in the woods, you know, and you know how the leaves... You know, you think you start, you're like, what was that? And it's just some stupid squirrel, you know. You think it's somebody chasing you. <laughs> but this kid's walking home, and then all of a sure enough, he's in that, he's at that spot, and it's getting dark, and he thinks he hears footsteps. He starts walking faster, you know, and he thinks he hears footsteps, and then he hears a voice. Son! Scares him out of his skin. It was his daddy. And his daddy said, son, I told you you go to school. He goes, but I wanted to meet you in the dangerous spot, in the dangerous place. And so his dad had come to meet him to walk with him the rest of the way. And here's the thing. God is going to meet you in the dangerous spots. And you don't have any comprehension now how it's going to work out. You have all these apprehensions, all these fears. God has got this thing. And he'll meet you in the tough spots. So we see his rattled peace, but I want you to also notice here in the text, verses 16 and 17, the restrained perception. Obviously, the difference between these two guys is what they're seeing here. There's a partial view, and then there's obviously a completed view that Elisha has, but the partial view, this guy's looking in verse number 16. He doesn't see what Elisha sees. All he can see is verses 14 and 15, the host surrounding them, these chariots and these horses and so forth. 16, he answered, Fear not, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. The partial view, he saw the many with the enemy instead of the few that were with them. It's just what he sees. And here's what you have to be real careful of. You form your perception based on what you are seeing. You know, we're looking down here and we're looking at things and you go down the road and you know, you know, okay, I could go to this road and I need to turn right because this is how I go. But you don't realize maybe that there is this huge construction taking place and even though you turn right, you're going to go another mile and you're going to have to turn around. But if you were in a helicopter and you were above that, you would be able to look and you will be able to see there's no need to turn right. But here you are with your limited vision. You're going along just looking at what you can see. And then you stop and then you turn right and you're going until you get to the place to where you're able to take it in. So the partial perception, the partial view forms a perception that's not always complete. And that's the idea here. The servant only sees the enemy. He doesn't see God's host. I was reading about that sometime in Revelation a few months ago, maybe a month ago. In Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the great hosts in heaven when they fight with the devil. And I'm thinking about the thing, all those hosts of angels. The Bible talks about thousands of thousands. And you begin to think about all the thousands and ten thousands of angels. When the Lord returns and we return with Him at the second advent, not only do we return with Him, but the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 1, He'll come back with His mighty angels. You know, there's one angel in the Old Testament, He kills 185,000 people like that. You ever read about that over in 2 Kings? 
the hosts of Syria, they come against uh, Hezekiah, the king of Judah. 185 dead like that. One angel. The Lord comes back with thousands of mighty angels. The Bible says there's war in heaven in Revelation chapter number 12. There's a distinction obviously being made there between the devil's power. And what will take place is the principalities and powers, these guys just went up in outer space. I have no desire to do that. Number one, I'm not going scuba diving. I might do some snorkeling, that's fun. But scuba diving, no, I ain't going in some cave somewhere where you're down there with some little oxygen tank. might get a little you know, piece of dirt in it. Something, and then you're plugged up and you can't see five feet in front of you. No, thank you. You can have it, not me. And I'm not going up there in the outer space. I'm not getting on some ship and going up there where the Bible talks about principalities and powers in heavenly places. You ever read about the day two of the creation week in Genesis? It's the only day when it talks about all the stuff up there, it's not said to be good. You say, why? Because there's some connection between that and the demonic spirits. The thing they just sent up there, you know what it's called? It's called the dragon. That's what they're riding around in, dragon. Well, I guess now they, I guess they made it to the space station. They're supposed to meet the space station this morning. I'm not going to go up there and go 17,000 miles an hour in the dragon. <laughs> That's not for me. But it's interesting, in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon, which is Satan, he moves from the second heaven and he comes down to the earth because you have an incarnation of the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13 after the midpoint of the peace and different things that take place in the tribulation. The Bible talks about the, son, the man of sin becomes the son of perdition and the devil, the Bible says, has come down to you having great wrath. How does that take place? The Bible says there's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and they were cast out. So you think about the power of these angels of these heavenly hosts. I know the devil is very powerful. If you want to study the devil, and you don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this because that's a weird subject, obviously. But the Bible tells us about Satan's power in Job 41. And he says he will not conceal his parts, his comely proportion, nor his power. And he reveals some things about the devil to us. He says in Job 41, he's the king of all the children of pride. But as it talks about the devil, it says none can stand before him. He says if you would see him, you would faint before him. That's how powerful he is. When Michael the archangel, not in the instance we read about in Revelation chapter 12, but in the book of Jude, verse number 9, it recalls the incident that took place back in Deuteronomy 34 when Moses dies. The Bible says when Michael the archangel disputed with the devil about the body of Moses, he durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. Michael the archangel would not rebuke the devil. He simply said, the Lord rebuke thee and left him alone. You don't need to get in a fighting match with the devil. You just leave him to the Lord and you move on. He is such a powerful being. However, he's nothing compared to God. Nothing. The demons, the devils, the principalities and powers, the wickedness that we see in our society now. All the images and idols, everything's image driven because the devil obviously gets worship by way of imagery. He's always done that, always will. He told the, the Israelites when they go into the land of Canaan, destroy the pictures. And so now you have all the images, all the idols, all the stuff, and that's why the devil is moving in to capture the minds and the imagination, the imagination of the people by way of images. You see all the wickedness, you see the hold that the devil has on the society. That's nothing compared to what God has. When the Lord returns, he will destroy the devil and the Antichrist just like that. Now you'll see his restrained perception. He did not see what he could have seen. Now you also have not just a partial view, but a prohibited view. Based on people's heart, a person's heart can determine what they see. Uh, we use the passage over in John chapter 9 for one of the great songs that we sing, Amazing Grace, I once was blind, but now I see. That comes from John chapter number 9 when Jesus healed the blind man there. And do you remember when you got saved, all of a sudden you began to see things. You saw that you were a sinner. You saw that you were on your way to hell. And you saw that Jesus was the only one that could save you. The light came on. The truth set you free. 
And now you are able to see other things. And now you can make judgments and assessments based on truth. And the more you get into the Bible, the more you're able to say, huh, that's right, that's not right. Somebody says, well, you know, you've got to be baptized to be saved. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. Well, you know, the Bible says, you know, uh, that people say certain things. You know, you have to have communion. You have to take of the communion in order to, to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. Now you have truth, and truth sheds light on error. But there's a prohibited view where if someone's heart is not open to the truth, they're not going to see the truth. The Bible speaks of this in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6. As a matter of fact, this passage is quoted in all four Gospels, and it's also quoted in the book of Acts. He says, Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted. Now Jesus quotes that passage when He gives the parable of the sower, and He says, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. He sowed some seeds by the wayside, they did this. He sows some seeds in stony ground. It did this. He gives four scenarios. And then he walks away. The disciples say, Master, what's the interpretation here? And Jesus says, Unto you it's given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but not to them. They don't want it. In other words, he told them that parable and he didn't, didn't tell them what it meant. Why? Then he quotes this passage. Lest they should be converted, he says. He goes, I'm not going to tell them what it means. They don't want the truth. Now, if you read the Bible, there's some verses that will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. One of them's over there in uh, 2 Kings with Jehoshaphat and Ahab when Ahab wants a prophet to come tell him what's going to happen in the battle. And Jehoshaphat, you know, he's from the south. He likes old time preaching. And Jehoshaphat's like, okay, let's have a prophet come in. And Ahab, the king of Israel, says to the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, okay, we'll get these prophets. And he gets all these prophets of Baal, and they're all they're very positive. They sound like Joel Osteen, you know. Oh, it's going to be great, king. Except they probably sound, it's going to be great. You're going to go in, and you're going to praise the Lord, and we're just going to have a great time. That's probably how they sound, you know, have a lisp and everything. And uh, Jehoshaphat's like, that don't sound right to me. Uh, you got any other preachers around here? And Ahab's like, I have one more prophet, but I got him locked up in jail. You know, he's been preaching pretty rough, and I hate him. Every time he preaches, he's got to say something that gets under my skin, and preach about some things I've been doing that I didn't know he knew about. And I don't want him, I don't want that guy. And he goes, well, bring him on out here. You know, I'm used to hearing somebody shuck the corn. So he goes and gets Micaiah, and the jailer goes back and says, Micaiah, all the other Joels have been preaching all this good stuff, and they've been, you need to declare the word of the Lord good just like they have. You know, you always got to say things to get under people's skin. You always got to quote that Bible and stuff. And, and why can't you just be like everybody else and be positive and be united and ecumenical? And let's all get through this together, and let's all, you know, just share one another. And why can't you be like that? And he says, whatever God tells me to preach, that's what I've got to preach. So he says, come on, Micah. And he takes Micah out there, and he stands up there, and, my, and Ahab's sitting there like, oh, brother, and Jehoshaphat's like, and Micah says, Ahab, I'm going to let you know, if Jehoshaphat wasn't here, I wouldn't even talk to you. But I'll talk to you. Elisha says the same thing here later on. But uh, maybe that's just Elisha that says that. Elisha's the one who says, I wouldn't say anything to you, not Ahab, but the other king of Jeroboam, unless, unless Jehoshaphat was here, but anyway... Micah is like, i got to say what God's going to say. But anyway, before he does that, he kind of plays the game and says, Go up, the Lord will prosper you. And Ahab's like, You ain't preaching right, you're just saying that. And he goes, You really want to hear it? Okay, here it is. The Lord standing around there at his throne, and he says, Who will go up and persuade Ahab to fall at Ramath Gilead? And the Spirit came up and said, I will. And the Lord said, How are you going to do it? And the Spirit said, I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And he says, The Lord hath sent a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets. God will deceive people if they don't want the truth. Who? God. That stuff will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. He'll put a bridle in the, in the nose of the people, causing them to err, the Bible says. I'll give you another example. The Bible tells us over there, one of them is Matthew 13, which I already gave you, the parable of the sower. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, end times prophecy, it speaks about 
the, obviously the rapture of the church, our calling up, our gathering together unto Him, and also the coming of the Lord. And in that passage it says, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Talking about people now who reject the gospel. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. That's a rough passage. That says God will deceive them. You don't want to see the truth? If your heart is bent and hard against God, there's plenty of error for you to believe. And God will let you believe it. One old preacher said, light rejected becomes lightning. And somebody thumbed their nose up in God, they thumbed their nose up at the truth, and they say, well, that's just how you see it. You can say that all you want about me, and I, got, I know i got opinions like everybody else. You know, everybody's got two armpits and they both stink. But when I talk to you about the Bible, you thumb your nose up at this, you better watch out. God will turn you around and flip you around so sideways, you'll be looking at something that nobody else can even see, and you'll be blind, you'll be deceived, you'll walk right off into a pit, right off into hell. Something was going on. This guy couldn't see what Elisha could see. Elisha is a man of God. Elisha is walking with God. I'm telling you, Christians, listen to me here. You are not going to see what God wants you to see in this life if you're not walking with God and fellowshipping with God. Your spiritual condition and what you see things in life is contingent upon your fellowship with God. That, that other guy... Should that servant here should have been able to see what Elisha saw, but he couldn't. Partial view, prohibited view. You know, you close your eyes, you can't see. Something gets in your eye, you can't see. Well, when something gets in your eye, you know what happens. Just immediately everything swells up and all of a sudden the tears start flowing. Everything's blurry. You might can still see, but you're seeing through all the tears... And sometimes that happens, right? Sorrow. When you have immense sorrow and the tears are coming, you can't see clear. Be careful making theological statements when you're in the valley. You better trust in the valley what God's shown you on top of the mountain, and you better have faith in the valley when you had the clarity on top of the mountain. Because you got those tears, it's hard to see through the blurriness. Sometimes you get older, you start getting those cataracts. Can I get an amen from... Amen. Somebody, somebody told us, I forget who it was, they're like, Preacher, I got my cataracts off now, I don't see but one of you up there. <laughs> I used to be double the power, right? Double the preacher, I used to see too. Sometimes when you get a little age, that begins to happen and you begin to lose sight. Sometimes you lose sight not just because of that. Sometimes you lose sight because of sin. You remember Samson? He got both his eyes put out. Why? Because of his sin. There's the prejudice view, making a judgment based on your view. Some praise at morning what they blame at night, but always think the last opinion right. <laughs> Oh, don't we think we're right? Boy, we're so stuck on ourselves. And we see something a certain way, and the reason you see it that way is just because of how you were brought through things, and you think your way is right. And then later on, you start looking at something different. I'm not talking about dogmatic doctrinal truths in the Bible. I'm just talking about life. Then you begin to see it from a different perspective. You're like, man... Finally, let's look at the revealing prayer and we'll be done. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. James chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth all men liberally and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. God says, ask. Pray, God, open my eyes. Lord, help me to see the truth. Good prayer to pray before you read your Bible is, Open thou mine eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. Lord, give me some understanding here. This is a spiritual book and I can't understand it unless your spirit helps me to understand it. This is not something to where you have to understand it first and then you believe it. You have to believe it first and then and only then will you be able to understand it. This is not some mathematical formula. 
Notice his sight replaces blindness. Open his eyes, he says, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. Wouldn't you hate to get to heaven just talking about fear and worry and panic? And look, I want to tell you this, like I've told you before. You've got to make your own discernment and your own judgments on things in life. And the Bible says to his own master he stands or falls. And uh, we all have to do that based on what information you have. But I believe we're in a, in a society now to where you get information overload and sometimes, you know, what do you do with it? You know, it's a very difficult thing. So you have to pray on a personal level and a personal basis and ask for God's discernment and wisdom in order to make a judgment and make an assessment. So you want to make sure you do that because we have to give account. And at the end of the day, so many things in our life, I know in my life there's been th times I've stayed up worrying or wake up in the middle of the night. I normally can fall asleep like that, but then I might wake up in the middle of the night, then something hit me, then I get to thinking about it. Then I'm like, Ugh. and then the next morning the sun comes up and you get a little bit of caffeine in you. And you're like, why did I worry about that? And then a few days go by and that whatever situation it was, it all panned out. Or you've got another perspective and you realize you were worried about something that did not even exist. You had actually invented a problem that was not there. I wonder how many things we get to heaven, the Lord's going to say, you were spending all your energy and all your time worrying about that and the Lord's got it under control. Let me give you this about the human eye. The human eye is very limited in what it can see. Our eyes respond to a very tiny segment of what is called the electromagnetic spectrum. Light is an electromagnetic radiation and our eyes are tuned to pick up its waves. The electromagnetic transmission is 60 cycles per second to cosmic rays, which are about 6 sextillion, which is 6 times 10 to the 21st cycles, whatever, per second. In between a radio, heat, light waves, ultraviolet rays, X-rays, gamma rays, Bruce Banner. Between the heat rays and the ultraviolet is that narrow sliver of the vast electromagnetic spectrum to which our eyes are sensitive. Okay. If a linear scale were used to represent this electromagnetic spectrum, it would be 300 billion miles long. That's pretty long. 300 billion miles. What do you got from East Coast to West Coast? 1,500 miles? Something like that? 1,800? No, no, no. It's about 20-something hundred. 300 billion miles long, the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible spectrum will be represented in that 300 billion long spectrum by one inch. So truly, we are nearly blind. The part that we can really see in this electromagnetic is, is one, one inch compared to if it was linear, stretched out to 300 billion miles. Here's what happens when his eyes are open. Fact replaces fear. Truth replaces error. All of a sudden, everything changes. <laughs> you see all these chariots of fire, and they're all ready to strike on the Lord's command. And we know one angel killed 185,000 people. All of a sudden, these Syrians that look like this big thing is now just like... Kind of like, you know, a little, little ant you stepped on yesterday. Big deal. Truth replaces error. Fact replaces fear. Calm replaces concern. Complete picture replaces the incomplete picture. Faith perceives the whole picture. Here's the question and we're done. Are you seeing life through the eyes of faith or through fear? Lord, open my eyes. We are on the winning side. No matter what circumstances and challenges in your life, whether it be health challenges, whether it be challenges in relationships in your life, whether it be financial challenges, whether it be emotional challenges, uh, social challenges with our crazy society we're in, whatever it may be, we're on the winning side. Paul says, we look not at things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things that are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. We are going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever and ever. What matters is what we do for Him in this life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. 
I saw the other day flipping through the channels, they were playing old football games or something. I'm thinking, what? I guess they can't play modern games, so they got to play old games. People that hung up on sports, they got to sit there and watch some, you know, game from 50 years ago. You already know who won. <laughs> it's crazy. And you think about the time and energy we spend on things that are temporary as opposed to the time and energy we spend on things that are eternal. What really matters? We need to live by faith, not by fear. And so, I'll close with this illustration. There was a man, you know, in London. I've never been. I like to go see Big Ben and Westminster and all those places. But they say over there they have the fog that rolls in. You know, the London fog. And it comes in. It's all thick. And, and years ago, there was a man... And there's uh, several people still out on the streets as the fog rolled in in the evening. And he's like, man, I can't find my way. I don't know where I'm going. He bumped into another guy. He's like, look, you know, I can't find my way home. And the guy says, where's, what's your address? Where do you live? And he told him where he lived. And he said, I know exactly where that is. Just grab a hold of my arm. And off they went. <laughs> and this one guy is leading this other guy in this thick, cut it with a knife, fog. And he takes him all the way to his house. And he says, is this where it is? He gets closer and he starts seeing, and he gets him all the way up to it. He goes, yeah, this is, this is it. How the world did you know? How could you see this? He goes, I didn't. He said, I'm blind. <laughs> he says, I'm used to all the landmarks. So I just fill all the landmarks and I get around town all the time without being able to see anyway. So the fog didn't bother me. We as believers need to live by the landmarks. Uh, the biggest landmark is that Bible. But you have landmarks in your Christian life where God has shown you that He's got this in, in control, where God has verified His Word, He's answered prayers, He's given you the promises, He's helped you, He's encouraged you. We have those landmarks. We need to live by the faith of those landmarks instead of the frenzy of the confusion that we can so easily get caught up in. So I want to encourage you in your faith this morning. Lord, open my eyes that I may see. That would be a good prayer. A good prayer. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, thank you for the time.